After our introduction to Victoria London and the initial attacks that entered into the Whitechapel murders police file, we now turn our attention to the canonical five, the murders attributed officially and without doubt to the murderer who was to become known as Jack the Ripper. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Mary Ann Nichols was a small woman in her mid to early 40s. She lived a colourful life, had been married for 24 years and had had five children. After many separations, she finally left her husband for good in 1881 and began living as a prostitute. She had turned to drink and was an alcoholic, moving from workhouse to workhouse throughout London. After taking a job as a maid, she stole clothing from her employers and took flight back to the workhouses she had become so familiar with. In the early hours of August 31st, she had met her fellow prostitute Emily Holland walking through Whitechapel Street on the corner of Osborne Road, just a stone throw away from the scene of early attack victim Emma Smith. She was apparently drunk and was having some trouble supporting herself without the aid of the nearby walls and told Emily that she had had her DOS money already three times that day, but drunk it all away. Ominously, she then told Emily that she would soon be back and disappeared down Whitechapel Street and into the night. At 3.45am, Mary Ann Nichols' body was discovered by Charles Cross in Bucks Row whilst he was on his way to work. Upon seeing her body, he called to a friend across the street. The two observed her and believed that she was possibly still breathing. They arranged her skirt to allow her some decency and agreed to tell the first police officer they saw about their discovery and continued their walk to work. On Baker's Row, they met PC Jonas Misen and told the officer of their grim discovery. Meanwhile, however, PC John Neal had discovered her body whilst walking his beat. He signalled to PC Thane, who joined him, and the duo were soon joined by Misen. PC Thane went to a local doctor's house, a Dr. Reese Ralph Llewellyn, who returned to Mary Ann Nichols' body with PC Thane, but pronounced her dead at the scene, though only by minutes. Mary Ann Nichols' body was found in a busy industrial area of Whitechapel. On one side of the street were warehouses and factories, and on the other, terraced houses belonging to tradesmen. Her body lay below one of the windows of the terraced houses, though when inquired upon, the residents claimed to have not heard any disturbances. She had minimal possessions, a comb, a white pocket handkerchief, and a piece of broken mirror. Dr Llewellyn was of no doubt that she was killed where she now lay, on the street of Bucks Row, her blood running into the gutter by her side. At the inquest, her wounds were described, She had several bruises to her face and several cuts across her abdomen. She also had three or four cuts deep and running downwards from her abdomen. She had also had her throat cut in two brutal wounds from her left ear to below her chin which had severed all tissue down to the vertebrae. Mary Ann Nichols was well known around Whitechapel and well liked. Her friends knew her affectionately as Polly and upon identifying her body for police were moved to tears. Her father, ex-husband and eldest son paid for her funeral and she was buried in a polished elm coffin in the city of London Cemetery. The Ripper had given London a taste of what was to come. Mary Ann Nichols was poor and had no valuables to steal. Her killing was violent and senseless and it was not long before he struck again. In the days after Mary Ann Nichols' murder, the press and residents of Whitechapel had begun to panic. Attributing the brutality of the crime to that of a madman who had vanished into the morning foot traffic, fear was creeping in. Annie Chapman was 47 years old. She was petite, standing only 5 feet tall. She had married and had three children, though her youngest died at age 12 of meningitis. She had separated from her husband in 1885, though reasons are uncertain it's heavily likely that both husband and wife were deep into drink at the time. She received an allowance from her now ex-husband, but after his death in 1886, took to prostitution to make her living. She resided at Crossingham's lodging house in Spitalfields and was seemingly in something of a steady relationship with a man named Edward Stanley, who often paid for her bed in Crossingham's. On the morning of the 8th of September, Annie Chapman was seen several times in her lodging house. She was drinking beer with Frederick Stevens, another lodger around midnight. She then appeared to go to bed, however, it's likely that she had left, as she is seen later returning eating a baked potato by John Evans, the night watchman. He had been sent to collect her lodging money, which she did not have. Annie went to see Donovan, the house manager, to explain she had no money for her bed, but told him not to worry for, I'll soon be back, and asked for her bed to be kept for her. John Evans watched her leave and turned towards Spitalfields Market around 1.30am. 
At 5.30 a.m., Annie was seen talking to a man in Hanbury Street by Elizabeth Long. The man had his back towards Elizabeth, who stated she heard him ask Annie, Will you? To which Annie replied, Yes. Annie's body was found at 6 a.m. laying in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street by a resident who lived on the third floor with his family. Upon discovering the body, he alerted three men on Hanbury Street and then went to Commercial Street Police Station. Annie's attacker had used a sharp knife to cut her throat. The wound was jagged and appeared to reach right around her neck. There was blood on the ground by her head and smeared onto the fence directly behind her. The murderer had then gone on to cut her abdomen clean open. Her intestines were removed and placed by her shoulder. Her uterus, upper parts of her vagina and two-thirds of her bladder had also been removed, but no trace of these parts were left at the scene. Dr George Baxter Phillips, upon describing Annie's body to the inquiry later, remarked that her wounds could not have been done in such a way through surgery without it taking a better part of an hour. These comments would later light the fires of the debate that Jack the Ripper was a skilled surgeon or butcher, or at least someone trained with a knife and possessing some anatomical knowledge, though this is something which is still debated today. Annie's possessions were a small piece of muslin, a comb and some pills. It was later to be found that she was dying either of tuberculosis or syphilis and had been suffering for some time prior to her murder. Her funeral was held in secrecy by her closest family so that only her relatives attended to avoid public attention. With Annie's death, the press had gone into overdrive, reporting the murder with extreme language and gruesome imagery. They published outlandish theories and criticised the police. Panic had struck Whitechapel following the second Ripper murder. The nightmare of the Ripper had begun. In the next episode, Jack continues to strike as wider London takes note and anxiety grips the entire nation. Please like, subscribe and sleep tight.